Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Yes. Sometimes yes. that works well, and sometimes, you know, you're looking at my screensaver. So I just want to make sure. Uh, first and foremost, let me let me give a few caveats before we begin. Uh, this is my first day back to University Action since last week. I unfortunately received a positive result for COVID-19 and have been battling it for the last, this is day 10 in quarantine. Uh, and it's actually a much better day, but I have to uh, put the caveat out there. I still have a bit of a nasty cough and it catches me unexpectedly. Uh, so please provide me some, some grace <laughs> during the presentation. I have my cough lozenges handy dandy <laughs> uh, next to me just in case. But if I break out in a coughing fit, just give me 10 seconds and I'll, and I'll get it back together. Um, and thank you in advance for that. So I'm so excited today uh, that Dr. C.A. invited me to participate in what I think is an awesome and timely uh, series for just us as a university, uh, you all as faculty, us as staff, uh, to really move us forward in what is, you know, an unprecedented, unprecedented situation. <laughs> Uh, and there's so much happening and it's happening quickly. So uh, uh, we've got a lot of moving parts that we have to address uh, in the best way that we can. So this is one of my favorite areas to address. Uh, before I came to Tennessee State University, I've actually been online faculty for a little over 10 years now. Uh, so this is an area I'm very familiar with. Uh, I have uh, much of a love for establishing online remote remote communities. Uh, online education is certainly one of the waves of the future and certainly uh, where we'll be sitting right now <laughs> for a while. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of practices that I've learned over the years, some things that I hope will be incredibly helpful <coughs> and supportive for you. And then hopefully we'll just have an opportunity for some wonderful discussion uh, at the end of the presentation. So I was so glad to include a, a brief bio and more importantly, a picture, because as I said, this is day 10 in quarantine with COVID. So I'm feeling a bit haggard. I probably look a, big ha a bit haggard. I don't know how I'm coming across, but this is actually how I look everyone <laughs> on a regular good day. So, <laughs> so keep that in your mind and kind of, you know, ignore, ignore this. If I could take my camera off, <laughs> I would and just talk, but then I become the talking head that I think most people hate when they're <laughs> in meetings. So, uh, so just a brief background, uh, as my bio shares, I've been in higher education for the better part of 15, uh, closer to 20 years now, uh, with both a foot in academia and student affairs the entire way. So I have an interesting blend of a background. Um, I'm a psychologist by training, uh, as most folks on the call that I've had some opportunity to work with in the past. Um, so folks have typically seen me operating around uh, mental health needs and things like that. Uh, but what most people don't know is that I've been faculty for, as I said, almost 15 years now uh, in both undergraduate psychology and graduate psychology and clinical psychology doctoral programs. Uh, for 10 of those years, I've been faculty online. Uh, <laughs> so I understand your pain. I certainly <laughs> recognize uh, what this transition has been like. And for some of you all, it might have been, you know, as easy as the tip of a hat. And for some folks, you know, opening the doors to a new world. Uh, and so I hope our discussion today will give us a good opportunity to kind of delve into some of the things that you might be dealing with, some of the things you may not have anticipated at all, uh, and hopefully provide some really good resources going forward. <laughs> excuse me, uh, for this academic year and, and for the unknown. We don't know how long this is going to last. It may be for the fall, uh, it may be for the year, and it may be going forward. Um, so having said that, what I hope to address in our time together today is just a brief history of, of the relevance of online instruction and education. It's actually been around for a very long time. I'm sure it feels new for many of you all. <clears throat> but it's not new. And the great thing about that is that means we have resources, right? Because it's not new. Uh, I want to talk briefly about some of the top 10 faculty and staff concerns that have uh, really been the topic of discussion in, in most of our trainings uh, over the last, you know, three to four months as we're navigating COVID, navigating new educational environments, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and really trying to figure out um, what this looks like and how it works. 
uh, some emerging themes, uh, asynchronous and synchronous learning has, is becoming the topic of the day almost everywhere when we're talking about remote instruction. So we'll talk about that briefly. And then we'll just spend the remainder of the time talking about how do we do this and we do it well. How do we do this and establish thriving learning communities, you know, sort of never miss a beat, if you will, uh, and, and make this distant education no longer distant, right? So that we can have engaged and healthy communities. So one of the things I wanna make sure uh, that we just acknowledge because it is what's true is that, <coughs> excuse me, we're absolutely transitioning into a new phase of learning, right? Uh, no matter what happens as we address COVID-19, I don't think we'll ever go back to traditional standard brick and mortar education uh, as we've done in the past. I think we are indeed in a new day. Uh, even going forward, learning will probably be hybrid uh, and, and there will be several aspects of technology uh, and remote learning incorporated in ways that we've probably never used before, but will be likely required going forward. Um, and so what we know about that is there are two ways um, that instructional learning takes place. Typically, you know, it's well planned. There's a background uh, of research and engagement for whatever course is being developed. Uh, there's a rollout period, so on and so forth. So online learning is, is really, you know, well planned out. What we're dealing with is a, is a bit more of an abrupt shift, right? Um, so this is more about emergency remote teaching, which looks a little bit different. <coughs> and so I want to acknowledge that. Uh, most importantly that, you know, often when we talk about remote teaching, we're talking about courses that have had, you know, months or years of planning and resource development behind it. And we don't have that. So what we're doing is emergency remote teaching and that's a more accurate description. Um, and I think that better captures a lot of what we're going to deal with a lot of the challenges that we'll have going forward. Uh, when we acknowledge that it's an emergency situation. I think we give ourselves uh, a little bit more leeway to operate in an emergency circumstance versus, you know, trying to be perfect and get it right, you know, uh, because that may not happen for everyone. But the great thing is, as I said, there is a significant body of, of research that exists as it relates to online teaching, as it relates to you know, how faculty can prepare for online teaching, some of the apprehension I'm sure many of you are feeling, uh, technology resources, as you can tell, we are using technology uh, just, I'm sure, in your own departmental meetings and things like that in ways we've never used before. I've never had such Zoom fatigue <laughs> in my life or Teams fatigue or, or Doxy me or just whatever platform you use. I don't even want to FaceTime my family anymore because I am just tired <laughs> of being on camera. So even the little things that used, I used to really enjoy, if it re involves a, 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 some sort of remote communication, I just, I just don't want to do it because I'm over it. Uh, so I can only imagine um, what you're experiencing now and what that will look like as we get ready for the fall semester, which will, you know, we're approaching quickly. We know that's on the way. Uh, so some of the challenges that I just want to, to put out there uh, for most of the faculty and staff that I'm hearing from is how do we keep the community engaged, right? How do we do this and keep our students engaged? What if I'm not engaged as a faculty member, right? Not all of us uh, are interested in online learning, remote learning. This may not even be a thing uh, we ever anticipated or wanted to do. Uh, most of us are traditionally trained uh, and we've operated traditionally in our faculty mode. So to do this remotely can, you know, represent challenge and discomfort for us as well and how we want to engage with the material. Uh, I know many faculty who don't like this whole idea of even being on camera, being online uh, and having to connect with the students that way. So there's certainly, you know, concerns on, on the faculty's behalf as well as the students. You know, many of them are looking forward to a traditional brick and mortar experience, right? They didn't want to go to college online either. So uh, some of them may not know how to navigate online environments. They may not understand some of the technology. Uh, we often assume that this is the generation uh, that's really into technology, but that doesn't necessarily mean <coughs> excuse me, that all students are. So we have to be mindful of that. And part of the ways we combat those experiences is by being uh, very purposeful in our community building. So part of online education um, 
<coughs> historically that's been very well done is how it builds community presence online. And so establishing that format um, is more than a notion, right? It's not like you just put a couple of videos together, put it in the classroom and the students will engage. That's not, you know, how it works. And so there are some very specific, very purposeful tasks that need to take place in order to prepare for that. And some of those things can be challenging. Um, learning new technology platforms, uh, figuring out how you're going to man your discussion area in your classroom so that there's ongoing communication, uh, <coughs> making sure that you're honoring both the student's educational experience and the fact that they're navigating, navigating COVID-19, as are you. So the households might look different. Uh, how, they, how they're able to even sit in their classroom if the entire household is home, if parents are home working, if there are younger children in the house that are doing online classes, if the students are trying to attend your class, or if you're trying to teach in those exact same circumstances. Uh, <coughs> it's just a, you know, a petri dish for challenge uh, for the most part. So I wanted to make sure that we talked about uh, some of those challenges in community building and some things that you can do to address that. And then I wanted to make sure to provide some technological tools because that's also one of the other things that we've heard about remote teaching in terms of challenging and concerns. Uh, if the Zoom platform is overwhelmed, right, you might have difficulty accessing you know, a meeting or for teams, if the team's platform is overwhelmed or e-learn or D2L or whatever the learning platform is going to be for your classroom, <laughs> we certainly have, <coughs> you know, millions of individuals across the world accessing these platforms in ways that we never have before. And so navigating that uh, is difficult and you and finding alternative tools to do that may be the best way to go as we prepare for the fall so that you don't have to depend uh, necessarily on one way of teaching your course for success. So I have a list of, of uh, 10 of the primary concerns that we've typically seen from faculty and staff as it relates to remote learning. And there is a learning community, <coughs> I don't know if you all are aware of it, but it's actually called the Remote Learning Community, um, RLC are the initials. And they did a survey in June, uh, once the school year had ended, just to talk to faculty and staff about what they experienced, how were they able to transition, what worked well, what didn't work well. And those 10 uh, uh, concerns that came up for faculty and staff were uh, facilitating the whole class and small group instruction. How do I do this? How do I keep that same uh, culture and community? There are particular classes that thrive on this type of format, having small groups, things like that. Um, and so faculty are really struggling with how do they make that work. Um, incorporating documents, which is, was a big deal. Think about all of the exams and quizzes and papers that had to immediately go online. Uh, in March, you know, there are many faculty who had never had to deal with posting these things or receiving them in an online format, grading and then getting that information back, uh, sharing documents, students may use a different platform than faculty use. And so, you know, there might be some disconnect in submission or uh, receiving of information because of the different platforms. Uh, how do you utilize student responses before, during, and and, and after instruction, right? In the classroom, that's just a normal black back and forth, right? You ask questions, students respond, they engage. How do we do this now remotely uh, and still provide that classroom experience? Uh, presentations has become a big area of concern. Uh, <clears throat> you know, do we ask students now to pre-record them? Uh, do we do narrated PowerPoints, which is a new term for many people, uh, things like that. Some faculty are even thinking about co-instruction, right? How do I teach a class with another faculty and cover some overlapping areas, <coughs> excuse me, to make the experience easier for students? Um, and then where I wanna spend some time today is uh, certainly connecting students and community building. But then also um, just establishing norms, right? What does this look like going forward so we don't continue to feel like we're operating in an emergency circumstance, even though, of course, we are. But at some some point, we want to get to a normal experience, uh, a, a classroom that students are comfortable and uh, excited and motivated to be in, and that faculty are comfortable and excited and motivated to be in as well. 
So typically, right, the difference between online education and emergency remote instruction is that we don't typically have, you know, a global pandemic <laughs> that would require emergency remote instruction. So one of the first things I want to be clear to say, and I hope you're saying this to yourselves every day, allow yourself and your students some grace in this process, right? This is not our norm. Uh, there's nothing that will probably be normal after this experience. So allow yourself, you know, whatever mistakes are going to happen in the classroom, have a backup plan for how you may have to deal with these types of emergencies. Allow your students the same grace. I know sometimes that can be difficult and the dog can only eat your homework so much, right? So I don't mean in every week, <laughs> grace, but I do mean many of the students are navigating, you know, their home lives as well. And if there really is a situation where the computer is unavailable or they couldn't get work in in time because there's a sibling that needs to use, you know, the resources or a parent, or if they're having to watch a sibling for a parent while they work or whatever that looks like, uh, you know, for the student that's, that's providing this information not on a regular basis, uh, it probably is true. And I would support them in that. Now, of course, for the student who, you know, comes in the class late <laughs> and is not doing the work and, you know, every week there's an excuse, now that's something different. And it may be individual circumstances where students come to you up front and just let you know they have circumstances that just, you know, may not uh, traditionally be conducive to them being successful. So you may have to work out some, some individual plans with a student or two. And that can seem... I'm sure daunting, but once you get into it uh, and you find your rhythm in online instruction, it's not, it's not that difficult. Um, there's all sorts of course design and development resources. I've noted, I hope you've noted, I'm sorry, in the bottom of this particular slide, there is a link and I provided URLs uh, for every resource information that I'm sharing with you on the PowerPoint and I'll make sure Dr. CA has that and that that's uh, distributed as well. But this website specifically is dealing with what is the difference between remote teaching in an emergency circumstance and online learning, and how do you use some of the tools that are already established for online learning in this emergency situation, and really just, uh, you know, revise as much as you need to to work as best as it needs to for you specifically. <coughs> lots and lots of good online uh, learning tools. So what we're seeing coming out of emerging themes around online instruction are a couple of areas of importance. Um, the first one is equity. And it's very important that we spend some time understanding what that means in the classroom. First and foremost, you know, um, we assume <laughs> that all of our students coming in, particularly our first year students, um, are coming in, you know, with same skill level, abilities, a uh, starting context from their senior year of high school as they get ready to transition to college. What we know for sure, uh, especially at Tennessee State University, is that this is not true, right? We have students coming from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of learning experiences, educational backgrounds and climates, uh, where there are going to be differences in um, how they learn. Uh, and so how we set up the classroom to try and make sure that we are as equitable as possible in our teaching will be incredibly important. We want to be mindful of, you know, eliminating any bias toward a particular student that, of course, there wouldn't be an intention for. And these would be things that we would often catch in the physical classroom. But in the remote classroom, it may not be that easy to see a student struggling uh, and to understand some of the background of why they're struggling. You don't have the luxury of pulling a student to the side, you know, having an, a conversation. You don't have a, the luxury of that student kind of stopping by your office and explaining their circumstance. So you real, really want to be mindful of how are you setting up your classroom so that it has an effective, equitable design. Uh, and are the students, at least as much as possible, right, um, offered the same opportunities for learning we may have students who, you know, like I said, are offering off, are operating off of one <coughs> laptop or computer for the entire family. That's a difference in equity for, you know, students who have personal laptops and everybody else in their family has personal, you know, ways of engaging online. Uh, some students may be able to access some software that other students don't have and they can't purchase it or download it or anything like that. So you want to be mindful of all of those things. I've attached, again, a URL link 
that discusses this more in depth and talks about uh, may, provides many different examples of how you can uh, set up your classroom, making sure that it that is an equitable classroom. Uh, your classroom design is incredibly important. And this is emerging as a big theme in remote instruction. Uh, part of it is because uh, just like we have Zoom fatigue, uh, students are going to begin to have classroom fatigue, remote online learning classroom fatigue, particularly those students who, again, did not have a, a, an online learning design in mind when they plan for college. So it's important that you think about how you set up your classroom for the learning, right? Is it is it status quo? Is it standard? Does your classroom, you know, mimic every other classroom in terms of the way that it's set up? Is it set up for a very simple, easy, you know, teaching style that might be more of your style, but it might not be as conducive for students learning? You want to think about all of that because your learning objectives and how you set up your activities uh, and how you evaluate those activities. And by activities, I mean assignments, uh, uh, recordings, presentations, things like that, and how you evaluate them you know, is, is really important and directly related to how the classroom is set up. And so if the students are unclear, if there's a lot of confusion, if there's a lot of extra language or uh, <coughs> unclear design and how the classroom is laid out, you're likely gonna have poor student learning outcomes. Um, and I know that this is a difficult semester. So it's as simple, as simple I'm sorry, and as, uh, as as clear of a layout and design that you can have for student learning in your classroom, you know, it's important to consider. Uh, and I know some of us have, you know, SAC, CLC, PTSD right now, but if you really think about it, this is a lot of what this, this SAC, CLC uh, process has been addressing that we're going through right now. What are our objectives across our programs? How are we meeting those objectives? Uh, and what information are we getting that's showing that we're meeting those objectives? Same thing in your classroom. What are your goals and objectives for your course? How are you setting up you know, the instruction to meet those objectives? And how are you evaluating students? Um, are you giving them an opportunity for both written uh, and physical presentations? Some students do better you know, in, in one uh, venue versus the other. So you just want to think about that. And then uh, when you're evaluating, when you're grading your students, uh, how are you giving grace to some students being uncomfortable in the online environment? Because you're going to want to address that as well. Not every student is going to take to this environment and take to it well. Some are going to struggle. And so you want to include that in your evaluative uh, uh, process as well. And then how you build, how you build community. So this starts right away. It can start as early as your syllabus, right? How is the classroom laid out for this new journey? It's a new journey. So it won't be, you know, where students come to class, pick up the syllabus, read through it, you know, kind of not off that first day of class and then, you know, get serious the next week, right? They're going to have to really engage from, from the very beginning of connection. And typically that's the, the syllabus. So how are you represented as a faculty? Uh, for some of you all who may have more extroverted or, or uh, funny personalities or things like that, maybe you include, you know, a, a comic strip or, or something silly that kind of represents you as, uh, <clears throat> as, as, as that aspect of your personality. Or some of you all who are, you know, hardcore, you know, deadline and, and information and content driven, make sure that what your expectations are for those students are planned out so that they don't confuse, you know, one faculty member style with another and they understand that you expect this particular way of engaging in your classroom. Um, how can you be creative? I know we all have standards for how our syllabuses are prepared and, and there are certain uh, organization uh, ways that they have to be presented. Can you be creative at all with that so that some of uh, some of your personality or just some some community building comes across in your syllabus so that students can kind of take a deep breath, know that, you know, this course is, is, is going to be okay, okay, even though it's being provided remotely uh, and things will still go well. And then also, how are you planning for your course interaction, right? So if you've planned to operate via eLearn, oh with you know no face-to-face -face engagement and students are just you know posting in the discussion area and turning in assignments i would offer you a reconsideration of that 
I think this is an interesting time and we're in an interesting space where the engagement of the student is really, really important at this time. So if you haven't considered how you encourage uh, some, course, some course interaction, even if you're not comfortable with the face-to-face, -face, maybe you consider a, a, a Zoom call uh, once a week and you can put your profile picture up, right? You don't have to be on camera. Maybe you consider a group me for the classroom. Uh, or you, you require a different type of discussion uh, area in your classroom. So maybe instead of a, you know, a, a once a week or a only post if you have a question, maybe you provide a, a, a thought question that leads off the week every week. And it could be, you know, about uh, uh, current information, current affairs, culture, TSU culture. It doesn't necessarily have to be classroom material related, but just to encourage that community that you would have, you know, when a student walked into your classroom and sat down and, you know, asked you about your weekend or you asked them about theirs or, you know, you've had them for the second or third time. So you know them well enough to just check in about how they're doing. Uh, <laughs> this is a way that you want to consider how you're going to do that if you have not already. And you may have to do some, some different things. You may have to get comfortable with some different tools of technology that you've not had to work with previously. <clears throat> Assessment and evaluation. This has emerged as a huge theme um, as we operate remotely, as you can imagine. We had many students uh, last semester that were really disappointed about many of the courses that had to go to pass fail, right? They were wanting a grade or needing a grade. Maybe it was about a GPA improvement or you know, a scholarship or something like that. Um, and so the switch <coughs> to, to some of our courses that had to be pass fail due to uh, the restrictions and, and, and the ways in which we had to transition was really a struggle for a lot of students. So you wanna think about how will the students be graded going forward? And is this clearly recorded? Do they understand what assignments measure out for what? what participation or engagement points they can receive. Will there be extra credit allotted for? Will their class be a pass fail or a, a, a letter grade? And if anything should change uh, and there's an emergency pivot again, <clears throat> what will that mean? What is the backup plan as it relates to how they'll be, how they'll be assessed and evaluated for the grades? Because uh, this was really a sore spot for a lot of universities, <clears throat> excuse me, as they had to pivot last, last semester. And then, of course, I, I know this is probably being beaten uh, to, to a dead horse, but I, I have to keep beating it. Technology, technology, technology. Uh, it can be your friend. I recognize that it's intimidating for a lot of folks who have not, you know, delved into this area and really didn't want to. Uh, it really can be used to your advantage. Uh, <clears throat> but you want to find out what tools work best for you. There are some platforms I just don't use, right? I can't figure them out. Every time I use them, something goes wrong. My sound doesn't come through or the camera doesn't work or something wonky happens. So figure out which platforms work best for you and use those only if that's what makes you feel most comfortable. Uh, if you don't wanna do a bunch of fancy pants stuff and some other faculty is doing it, let them do it, <laughs> then that's fine. Or even ask for a personal training session if you're up to it. But if you found a niche that works for you, that is just fine, stay with it. If you'd like to learn more about technology and using it in your classroom, I don't think it's anything but an advantage uh, to how we'll have to move forward. So if you're open to that, uh, and I would ask that you please be open to that uh, in this remote learning environment, take a training or two. Um, as, as I've said, for every one of these emerging themes, I provided a URL for all sorts of resources. And I mean, everything from examples of you know how to establish equity in your classroom, how to build community, how to assess and evaluate remotely, all of those things to actual training. Some have many conferences, many workshops, everything. For the most part, every one of these URLs provides free information, downloadable information uh, to assist you with every aspect of uh, uh, developing not only your course remotely, but building the community in it remotely. Uh, so please utilize them to the fullest extent that you need to. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, any questions before I, I keep going? I know I've just been rolling, rambling off anything. All right. Dr. C.A., are you saying anything? I see you, but I don't know if you're muted. No? Okay. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, good deal. I was just... 
So one of the things that's become a, 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 a strong area of focus now, and it always has been for online learning, uh, but certainly as we move through COVID-19 and navigating it, it's come up uh, even more so. And that is how do we best use uh, asynchronous and synchronous learning and teaching? Uh, what does that look like? Many of us have, you know, our own style, our own way in which we engage in the classroom. You know, some of us have been teaching for, you know, years and years. And so it's become, you know, our signature way of operation. And COVID-19 has really changed how we're able to do that. So synchronous and asynchronous learning has become incredibly important going forward. Um, and there are different ways that both of them benefit, right? So there are some courses where, you know, one or the other is just not going to be applicable. Uh, and that's fine. But just understanding <clears throat> the benefits of each is really important. So synchronous learning, and you all know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm just going to say it, um, is, is education that happens in real time, right? That's, that's right now. That's us on Zoom together or on, you know, uh, eLearn together or Teams together, whatever we're doing. And I'm lecturing or I'm teaching or students presenting or whatever is happening, but it's happening in real time. So these are your lecture heavy courses, your uh, courses that may have labs, things like that. And there are huge benefits to teaching live, right? I know there's a lot of faculty right now probably shaking their head like this is not my thing. <laughs> but you taught live before, right? When you were on ground, it just it just wasn't you know on camera for for the most part. Uh, but the wonderful part about synchronous teaching is that you know it's predictable, right? The students have a predictable schedule. You know we meet every Tuesday, Thursday, ten twenty, whatever that looks like. Um, they log into their classroom. There's accountability there. You can take attendance right right from the participant. Uh, 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 link. And so you know who's in class, you can see their faces, you know that they're engaged. Uh, so that's a huge benefit for synchronous learning. Uh, it also provides an opportunity for um, guided practice, right? So you can put examples up, you can uh, pull websites up right there while you're teaching, you can connect directly to your own PowerPoints uh, and guide them through it as you're teaching, which is important for a lot of students. Uh, Again, it's building that community that's more similar to a live classroom. They see you, they see their classmates, they see their peers. Uh, they know that they know they're in it together. Uh, it makes a big difference. You can also, again, do that live interaction, whether it's question and answers. Uh, the way that you tell a story may not reflect the same, you know, if you write it versus you teaching it and sharing it with the class. Uh, it may not resonate in the same way. So synchronous learning can be helpful that way as well. The other thing about synchronous learning that's awesome is it can also be recorded. So the students can go back. Uh, it's almost like uh, taking notes to the 100th uh, power, right? They can go back and review it as many times as they need to uh, so that if they miss something in a lecture while you were talking or while you were sharing or teaching or a student was presenting, they can go back and walk themselves back through that. Uh, and, and, and there's, I, I can't even say enough about that, you know, that's why a lot of students often ask to record courses or lectures because they need to go back and have that repetitive learning process. Um, at the same token, you know, there are all sorts of benefits to asynchronous learning as well. This is more our independent learning, what we want students to do on their own. Sometimes this is more about preparation for the class, uh, but this, and all, this can also be used, especially in this particular environment, uh, when we won't be able to, to, to meet every day on campus or, you know, a student can't just stop by, you know, your office and hang out and learn new material. Um, so this definitely provides more flexibility. So these are your, you know, your activities or readings or videos or whatever that you provide already in the classroom, right? The students go ahead and, and read it on their own or watch it on their own or whatever it is they're expected to do to either be prepared for the next class time or to just know the information for an evaluative assignment. So this provides the student all sorts of flexibility, right? You might have a student who's, who's like me, who's a night owl. I do my best work at, you know, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, nobody's holding class at three o'clock in the morning, right? Uh, but, but this may be the time where, you know, they work best and they can sit and read that material or watch that video. It also may be the time where they have privacy. You know, it might not be until after seven, eight o'clock when, you know, the parent schedule dies down or if there are other uh, siblings or younger siblings who are in classes themselves. You know, this may be when the house quiets down from work or from school or from other things and they have the capability of, of completing the assignments. Um, 
it also allows the opportunity for the student to go back and kind of think through a thing before they submit it or think through a thing while they read it or watch it, so on and so forth, um, without interruption, without distraction. You know, sometimes distracting things can happen in the classroom. I've had meetings, you know, where my dog will start barking or <laughs> something ridiculous, you know, and then I've got, you know, five minutes of trying to deal with that circumstance before I can get back to the material. That's a distraction and it might throw a student off and they can't, you know, refocus and get back engaged. So two very different ways of learning, uh, beneficial either way, and certainly in this remote environment, important to really consider how you set these things up to build community. And again, this goes back to equity too. To have a good balance of both is helpful because you'll have some students who do very well um, with either form of learning uh, and, and to have them both might benefit how the students go forward. Uh, one of the things that I think is incredibly important, and this is something that I, I do uh, when I teach online regularly, is before we even begin, and I know we're coming close to our start date, uh, we're not, I think we're roughly three weeks away, if that, um, is to engage as early and as often as possible with the students. Um, so they already sort of feel a wraparound, they already feel uh, a connection before they even begin in your classroom. So if you have the ability to post announcements, um, I know eLearn has that opportunity, Blackboard does as well. I think D2L does. Uh, but you can send it via email if you don't have it in the classroom and just welcome the students. You won't believe how much of a community building activity that is just to receive a welcome from their faculty that says, hey, I know, you know, this is a strange world we're living in. This will be a new experience for the both of us. You know, I'm excited to have you in the classroom. These are students who have been anxious, you know, since March, right? They've had some communication from the university, but not a whole lot as it relates to their individual classroom, their individual experience, especially for our first year students. You know, they're, they're as nervous as they would be if, if they were on campus walking into your classroom. They don't know what to expect for many of them this is the first time they've had college instruction if they've not done de courses or things like that and they are terrified so to receive just a welcome from their faculty saying you know i'm here i'm preparing for you we're probably going to have some mistakes along the way but it's okay you know welcome to tennessee state uh welcome back to tennessee state you know whatever that looks like this goes a very long way in building community if the first time you know they've touch their faculty is the first day of class you know and you know there's no uh, uh personal engagement that can be very intimidating for students um and can sometimes uh, uh keep them from engaging in your course uh in the way that i'm sure you would want them to also be mindful again of providing grace uh, when you send that welcome email you know a student may email you back with a with a list of, of concerns that they have or fears or worries. Remember, you're not there in person. So they're waiting to unload <laughs> what they're worried about. Uh, so just be mindful of, of, of what their fears might be, their concerns about your class, especially for the more difficult courses, uh, your, your, you know, your math courses, your statistics, engineering, those things that are traditionally more difficult for students, especially students learning these courses online you're going to have to be very purposeful in how you keep those students engaged and connected in a big way of doing that is just you know an email to welcome them an email every week hey we're plugging along you know things are going well uh very proud of you all you know whatever whatever that looks like uh those things that you wouldn't traditionally need to do because you see your students all the time and you have an opportunity to do those little you know, water cooler pass by moments you won't have and students will miss it. Believe me when I tell you, they will miss those little interactions that really just keep them connected to the classroom. So consider that. Maybe set yourself a weekly reminder. You can even, this is something that I do. I have a, a Word document that's just full of motivational quotes. It's probably about 35 of them, to be honest. And once a week, I'll just send one out right? It's already prepared. I don't need to do anything special. I already have it, especially when we get around, you know, midterm, final exams, where we're already remote and students are probably worried. I send those things out all the time. Just pick me up motivation, silly stuff, cartoon, uh, uh, cartoon uh, uh, clips, things like that. 
just to let the students know, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm, I'm wanting the best for you. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not always a stick in the mud, even when I'm, you know, fussing and making sure that you get things in on time. Or, if, you know, if you got a paper back for me and it's, it's red lined and, and it went really bad, there's nothing better than getting a follow up email from me a couple of days later that just says, hey, you know, we're plugging through this together. I believe in you. Things are going to be great, you know, and, and they're right back in the game. So just something to consider. If you don't have something already set up, now might be the time for you to just have that. And it takes that away from one more thing that you need to do. Um, so I just wanted to provide some very specific uh, information about how do you build community? How do you set up community? Sort of uh, step by step, what's most important that we know as it relates to remote learning, or at least the things that I've learned um, as a remote instructor for some years. The first thing is course access. This is a big deal, especially, again, for our incoming students who have never um, had to interact in this way before. Uh, you know, they might have some difficulty. So allow some grace with them getting all set up with their course information, with their login information. I know some students who've been admitted uh, but still don't have their class schedule down, you know, right? They still don't have their login information, their T numbers uh, uh, correct and every, so on and so forth. So we may have some students that will have some, some issues around this. Be mindful of that. Uh, set your course expectations very clearly on your syllabus, in your email communication. Set it clearly and say it often. Um, again, keep in mind, these are young adults. They don't tend to be the most responsible <laughs> population ever. Some are. Uh, but 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 they're still college students. And so what you don't want, you know, is the, you know, two month later conversation of I never saw that. I didn't know this was expected. Where did you post that? I didn't see it. Right. So on and so on. Uh, so forth. So set your course expectations very clear and post them often. Um, I typically make like a week one, week two, week three sort of announcements thing. And then I'll repost them, you know, week four, five, six, seven. So just in case you missed it, here it is again. And here it is again. Um, so, so I can't get the, you know, three months later, I missed that posting, you know, kind of a conversation with the student. Um, how will you be responsible for office hours? That will need to look a little bit different. Will you do it via Teams? Will you do it via Zoom? You know, how will you do it via telephone? Maybe you don't want to do anything camera related at all. And if you will, what are some subjects um, that you may need to do uh, via video so that you have that personal or one-on-one -on -one interaction with students? And if you're uncomfortable with that, what does that mean? How, how will you address that? Uh, do you have background set up? This is a big deal. Uh, most people don't want students in their homes, right? So have you downloaded a, a background or do you have a designated area uh, in your home or, or wherever where you're working that you're comfortable with people seeing? You know, as I shared earlier, I'm, I'm on day 10 of, of quarantine. Normally I'm in my home office working, so I don't have a background, but I'm in my bedroom because I'm quarantined, right? I don't I don't want to invite you all into my bedroom. <laughs> so I have a background. So think about those kind of things when you're engaging with students, especially anything via video. Um, you want to make sure how you want your environment to be protected as well. Um, and then again, will you have other ways of engaging and presenting and interacting remotely? Uh, like I said, many classes have group needs just for that class. So there's, you know, any time discussion between the faculty and the student. If a student shoots off a question, you know, at 12 o'clock at night, you know, faculty can catch it if they're up. And if not, first thing in the morning, they can see it. Maybe another student has already answered it, you know, so on and so forth. So just think about what you're most comfortable with um, in terms of access, in terms of technology, in terms of visibility, in terms of presentation, uh, and state that over and over and over again. So students know what to expect and they know what you're asking for in terms of their access to the course and their engagement in the course. Um, communication, communication, communication is key. I cannot stress this enough. Um, remember, students will be working all sorts of ways. Some students won't have a computer or a tablet. They'll be accessing your class from a phone or they'll be accessing it from their iPad, you know, or if they have a computer, of course, then they'll be doing that. So their communication will look different. It may come across differently at times. So if somebody's typing a message in their phone, right, they're more likely to make mistakes than they are you know, on a computer where, you know, the letters are larger, the, uh, the environment is easier to read from. Uh, so if you're a, a, a grammar nut, like I am, 
you know, provide a little bit of grace <laughs> for communication that may have typos over and over because maybe that student is using their phone uh, to, to type a message. Um, try and provide as much daily communication as you can. Again, if it's just an email going out, that's a reminder email. Hey, see you in class in 45 minutes. You know, hey, don't forget, you know, today is presentation day. Hey, whatever, whatever that looks like. Um, the more you communicate, the more that student feels connected, the more they feel involved in that environment and that learning experience, and the more they're excited to be in that class, right? The more they're motivated uh, because online instruction is, is hard. A again, think about the Zoom fatigue that we're, we've been feeling now just over the summer of, of meetings and engagement. Imagine when students are now, you know, in class all day, every day, via remote instruction, it's going to be difficult. So maybe you send out a communication that has nothing at all to do with the class. Maybe it's, you know, something funny or a check-in or, uh, or an activity that's an alternative activity just to get the classroom engaged together. Remind them to check into their classroom daily so that they don't miss anything you've posted. Uh, let them know they'll be responsible for that as well. Hey, if I posted a message on Tuesday for something that was due Friday and you missed it, you know, my expectation is that you post, I mean, you log in every single day. Even if we only have class twice a week, take 30 seconds, check your classroom because I may send something out to you and you will be responsible for that. Make sure that you share that with them and make sure that you're doing it as well. It's very easy to fall into a pattern when you're uh, uh, teaching remotely uh, to only get into your classroom when you're in class, right? So if you're Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or Tuesday and Thursday, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into the pattern of, well, I'll be in class tomorrow, so I'll check tomorrow. You know, check every day. You may have a student emergency. You may notice a broken link. Something may be wrong. You may have updated information. So get in there every day and often um, and just check and make sure all is well. Uh, and certainly if you have, you know, synchronous classes, you're going to have scheduled class time each time. Uh, and so I would schedule that regularly, even for your communication as well. Um, clarify this again say it over and over and over and over again so students know you're expecting it um, make sure you're very clear on assignments how they're going to submit assignments how they're going to turn in homework what's the grace period for getting in homework again being mindful they may not have a computer to themselves so uh, do you have a 48 hour you know policy or a 24 hour policy or is due on this day at this time period whatever that is make sure that it's clear repeat it often often i'm sorry and what are you using for submission uh do you are you submitting only in the e-learn classroom can they email it to you do you have a google docs uh link anything like that you want to make sure that you're clear on every classroom assignment and how they're going to submit it keeping in mind this is new for them as well so you may need to walk them through the directions you may even need to provide them in a written way for how to submit a document it seems elementary but for students who have not had to do that for an academic component, um, you know, they may be worried and have fears about getting those things in on time and correctly. Uh, <clears throat> all this is just information of, of for you specifically about how you can learn remotely, uh, how you can teach your students how to learn remotely, uh, and just all sorts of information, um, uh, updating your computer, making sure you uh, uh, have an operating web browser. For some things, Chrome is wonderful. For some things, Safari is wonderful, Firefox. Which platform, which web browser is best for your classroom platform? You wanna be mindful of that. Um, uh, I have some situations where I can't open Outlook in my Chrome, right? So I may have to go to Firefox to do that or use Teams. So you want to be mindful of that and you want to share that with your students as well. Basic computer technology uh, language, you want to be familiar with that. Your students are going to be familiar with that. You want to know, you know, what a Google Doc is, what a, you know, a, a, a web doc is, things like that, because they're going to be asking you questions about can I do it this way? Can I do it that way? You know, you're going to want to know what it is they're referring to. And then just strategies. As I've said repeatedly, give yourself time, allow your students time uh, to complete assignments, to get acclimated to the new environment, to be comfortable with online learning. Uh, sometimes this can require even more time than face-to-face, -face, believe it or not, because you don't have the opportunity of really um, understanding or engaging with one another and, and getting the point right away. So you may be required to engage more with your students than you typically do or them with you so that you understand 
what a potential issue might be, or you understand where they may have difficulty or be stuck or anything like that. Um, again, think about your space, right? And encourage your students to do the same. Let that be one of the first conversations you have. What is the space that you're going to work in? Is it conducive for academic su success? You know, for those of you all who are, who are working at home, you may have your home space set up very different than your, your office space, your academic space. So how can you do that for your best learning environment? Do you need to set up a small home office? Is there a certain, you know, picture, plant, anything that you know you enjoy looking at every day or that you have in your office that is a thing that you know gives you peace after a rough day or whatever it is think about what that background what that space needs to look like if you need to download backgrounds for your video presentations like right now make sure you do that and have those things uh, prepared. So if you need to switch out, if you're having a rush day, you know, and somebody's in the living room and that's where your space is and you're going to have to teach class from the kitchen and you need to throw up a background really quick, make sure you're prepared to do that. Um, asking questions a lot. Your students are going to ask you so many questions because this is a new environment for them. Be patient allow them the opportunity and the space to do that. Allow yourself time to go back and revisit questions over and over uh, because they're gonna have a lot. There's gonna be some lag time. There's gonna be some mistakes. Allow for those things. And then just help. There are so many resources out for you, resources out for your students. You know, don't wait uh, to ask for help. If you need it as faculty, encourage them not to wait to ask for help if they need it as students, right? because uh, this is a new environment for everybody. And what we don't wanna do is get to finals week and find out that a student you know, never knew how to access three out of the 10 assignments you know, or, or didn't know they had to upload a video presentation and didn't know how to do it or, or whatever. That can be a nightmare. And so I've also listed uh, a gang of resources for online emergency instructing, instruction. Remember, we want to categorize this as what it is because this allows you the opportunity for grace and mistakes. This is an emergency. This is a, a big pivot. Uh, and we're asking you to do something that you wouldn't typically do. So uh, everything from setting up your classroom to resources to uh, how to use technology tools, everything you can possibly think of, again, is provided by these links. And just take some time uh, peruse what you need, throw out what you don't, that's fine. Uh, but it's been really helpful for me. And what we'd like to get to ultimately is, right, we're no longer distant learning. We're, we're together. We're in community with this thing, no matter how long it lasts. You know, it feels like we're learning together with one another and not distant learning. So, you know, that's where we're trying to get to ultimately because we've got to get these students to graduation. That's our goal at the end of the day to give these students the academic experience that they need and deserve in order to help move them toward graduation. So support yourself in every way that you need to get the resources, have them available, spend some time looking through them, find what works, what doesn't work um, and move from that point. Balance your synchronous and asynchronous uh, op learning opportunities. Balance them. It will be great for your students in your classroom. It will also be great for you. It will take some of that stress off of you. If you could pre-record a thing, if you could assign a video, if you can do something that gives them some independent learning and then balance that with your uh, in-face and in, uh, face-to-face instruction. Organize your physical and digital teaching environments as we just talked about. Make sure that your space looks like a space that you can thrive in. Encourage your students to do the same. Uh, even if it's just a corner of space that they have, make that corner their own so that they can be successful. And then put it all together. It's new, it's gonna be different. Um, it probably won't feel uh, uh, very good for most folks who don't enjoy online teaching or learning or who just never thought they'd find themselves in this environment. Um, I just ask you to be open to a new experience uh, for teaching, a new experience for learning. I learn something new about technology and remote learning every time I look up new information and find out some of the amazing things that, you know, folks are doing, some universities are doing, some uh, innovative faculty are doing. So just be mindful and open to that. And I think, well, I'm four minutes over. <laughs> uh, I, hope, I hope that wasn't too long, keeping folks too long. So I'll just open it up, Dr. C.A., I don't know if we have a minute or two uh, for any questions at all, but if we do, uh, 
let me know. I got through that without coughing, which is amazing. I'm super excited. <laughs> I did go through about three cough drops along the way, but I'm so glad. I thought this was going to be horrible and all y'all would hear was me coughing the entire time. So thank you for awesome. embracing the little bit of coughing that happened. <laughs> Let me just say uh, first that a lot of people have put in the chat that they're very happy that you are feeling better. And thank uh, you very much. We much appreciate, appreciate you being with us. So, um, <coughs> and we're happy that you made it through without, you did great. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yes, I'll let open it up to questions. Sure. This is uh, Dr. Padgett. I have just uh, two quick questions. Uh, you know, uh, first, in terms of uh, textbooks, are uh, I might have missed this, uh, are all the students going to have the um, book bundle uh, because we may or may not be able to get our copies to all of them? And the second question is, is there going to be like a general onboarding for the first semester freshmen? I know last year when we, well, this year when we went virtual, uh, I have 90% freshmen and they, they were amazingly resilient. But the students coming in are not going to know anything about <coughs> course management system or, or who knows what. So book bundle and is there going to be a general onboarding for new students? So I'm going to defer that to Dr. C.A. I am, I am not positive about how, uh, because that's academic and I'm actually uh, in student affairs, I know a little bit about uh, some of the onboarding that we're trying to support with our respective units in student affairs, but I don't know um, if, if if academic affairs has planned an onboarding as well. So I well, okay. In terms of the book bundle, Dr. Paget, um, it's basically um, uh, still those Gen Ed courses that we have been part of the book bundling and, and there's some other courses that some departments have adopted that are part of the bundle. Um, however, it's my understanding that the bookstore is putting some things in place to um, ensure the students are able to get their the books and resources and um, maybe we'll have more information about how they're going to manage that and can share that with you. But I'll, I'll have that written as a question. And then um, uh, the students will have their freshman orientation as normal, I think. As a, I mean, they'll be doing it virtually. For example, they've been hosting um, the virtual orientation sessions now in which they are helping the students with the registration process. But I think according to the academic calendar that is now posted, in case you haven't been out there to look, um, it did indicate that there will be some time for um, orientation. And so the other thing that we're asking too is the reason that we put the course template um, in every course shell this time was to help you all um, in providing this information and guiding the students through this process a little better. Um, so if, if you notice there's a getting started module and within that there, there are things in there that about course expectations and to help the students understand, I mean, what's the good space for them as they're learning remotely, time management. And so um, please, we're hoping that you take full advantage of that template, look it over carefully, use what you can to kind of help support uh, not only you as we make, we make the transition, but also the students because we will be online for those first couple of weeks um, and then uh, someone else has in the um, in the text in the chat about the um, OER resources that we do have available not only through the library but we do have a module in the pandemic workshop that is just on OER resources maybe a little bit late to adopt a textbook you know at this point but certainly there there's a lot of free resources out there that you may want to consider to incorporate in your courses i know that was a long answer. okay and dr ca oh there's dr melton she's still here thank you yes i'm still here i have great news for everyone since the presentation regarding oer open education resources we have received a grant renewal 
So for the fall to just help you in planning for the spring or just trying some of the OER supplementary materials, we are able to provide a small stipend for your time and effort in just looking through the OER. So again, yes, we have received a grant renewal. So if you are interested in OER, please let me know and I will put you down on the list and we will have other virtual trainings and to walk you through in the fall after registration, uh, how you can incorporate and enhance your course. <laughs> And then I think Dr. Briggs, I mean, Dr. Dr. Revelon actually said to, um, and she indicated in the chat to, to reach out to Dr. Alvin um, about electronic versions of your textbook. So. Cheryl? Yes. yes. Hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Murphy here. I got, I got in a little late, but I noticed one thing you said that we should, um, make copies of our lectures so they're available record our lectures no i First think what we, i'm sorry First yes was if we do do that mm -hmm. what do we have to do to get those posted and available to the students we have um purchased a solution uh the panopto uh video um content management system to help with that so as a part of your regular Zoom, um, of course, everyone can, has the capability of doing a recording based right. on that, right? right. Records it to the cloud currently. And if you're doing it through the Meets platform, then those recordings are automatically posted in eLearn. Uh, but if you wanted to do um, some pre-recorded things, then the Panopto uh, is a great tool to do that as well. Oh, okay, um, I don't want to do that backup. If I just want to record my lecture. While you're in Zoom? While I'm in Zoom, when I'm done, it gets put into the cloud automatically? Yes, when you, you, when you click on record, it's going to say record to cloud or record to computer, oh. right? Um, if you, the thing, if you re record to um, the cloud, and if you have initiated your um session via the meets meets platform i'm sorry someone if, if you if you've initiated through the meets platform then that recording will uh populate within the meets platform so the students can then go there to view the recordings like uh, just make sure it. that make sure that you have the audio transcript feature turned on which means you have to go to your zoom dot us settings to make sure that's turned on so that they have some type of captioning that goes along with that um, also guys remember with any recording that you do post it is important that you go in and check your um check your closed captioning review them uh, for errors or if it if it if it picks up something that you said and puts it in very differently you do not mm -hmm. want to post anything that has not been reviewed mm -hmm. so uh, that's one important step for everything that you put up it needs to be closed caption number one and then you also need to check it i don't know if i answered that question okay um uh, dr okay. yes ma'am um what you just said i was taking notes but things like that that involve you know remember to um to go into settings and and set the audio can we put that in like where it'll be visible uh like in elearn is there a way to to post instructions like that so that they're easily checkable when you you get ready to do it what we've done we hope is in the we have some instructor resources that we've included in each course template. Oh, okay. Um, they're in a draft form. I, I think we put that information in there about the Zoom and, and about the audio trend, I mean, audio, turning on your audio transcriptions, but it's information in there about how to use Panopto, but it's in every course shell. There's a draft module that's called instructor 
extra resources. Thank you. That we've put in every course. So hopefully we've covered everything. Now remember guys that we're also hosting help sessions from here on out. I mean, um, we'll start Saturday and Sunday sessions. And so we will certainly be more than happy to address any specific questions that you have and go over anything. So you're not alone in this. We're, we, we got a lot to do in the next three weeks, but um, we certainly want to help you. How do we connect to those help sessions? Um, it's actually the same link that we're using. We put we posted the schedule out on Exchange. Right now we're doing them on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. That's what I saw, and I clicked on that link, and it went the to link, blank Zoom. No, the link, the, I'm going to work with Academic Affairs on reposting the, the announcement because it's taking you to the survey to sign up for the passport. Right. But guys, just know that this is our training. This this link works for everything. This is the same link. Oh, okay. It, so it's just a matter of joining at the times that we've prescribed. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Range, you had your oh you you put your hand down. Did you have a question, sir? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. This is not more of a This is not a question, really. It's more of a request. Um. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for us to request for a full Adobe suite, you know, the professional? For example, um, there are a lot of some test materials or evaluations that I want to do, but they need to access it through a PDF fillable kind of thing. But I think before I do that, I have to purchase my own. If PSU can have that resource that would be wonderful. I'm just wishing. I know that's a good wish. I put it down. <laughs> but it's really just Adobe uh, Acrobat Professional. I'm yeah. not. It's not the creative. It wouldn't be the entire suite. But I've, I've put it down. I, I I appreciate you. Another one, Doctor C. Um, I have in my PowerPoint. I know it has to be. Access for accessibility purposes or something like that, it has to be converted into PDF. Am I correct? So that they can, if somebody has a disability or accommodation, something like that, they can, some, somebody can read it through them, right? Instead of doing it in a PowerPoint or a Word document, am I correct? Yes, that would be, that is, that is correct. And guys, let me just say this, people are putting in there about the Adobe licensing in the chat. I've written it down. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm talking about not the entire suite. Let's take that off the table because we <laughs> cannot afford a university wide license for the entire suite. But I've certainly written down about Adobe Pro and, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the pricing is on that right now, but I have written it down as something to look at, uh, to, something to look at. Okay. As for a university wide license, so just just hang tight. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Can I just yeah. give a quick shout out? Uh, it's it's fun when you get to see your faculty um with you uh, who was responsible for teaching you when you were a student. So I have to say hi to Dr. Mary Shelton <laughs> from one of her long time ago <laughs> PhD students in in counseling psych. It's great to see her on screen. <laughs> Elton. <laughs> I think she might be frozen. Oh, uh, did she leave? No, she's here. I think oh, okay. she might, be, might be frozen. So, um, uh, guys, I, you're I just a have a quick clarification about the Zoom transcript. Yes. If you're recording a session on eLearn to the cloud, and then that's automatically going to get put in your class under recordings, Will the transcript automatically, or do we need to do another step to have the transcript? The transcript is automatic. Okay. Now, guys, you can always go into zoom.us and view all of your recordings. So you that would be where you might want to go in to check the audio transcript file, just to make sure it's solid. Also know that with Panopto, if you did want to... Um, download or if you've downloaded any of that to your computer you can bring those back up uh, upload them through panopto and 
within Panopto, I mean, you can upload any video file that you currently have and then use Panopto to generate your closed captioning. So uh, somebody asked me earlier about using YouTube, but I think we're going, we're going beyond that now with, with us uh, in implementing the Panopto. So you don't necessarily have to post your stuff out there to the YouTube channel if you don't want to. With, by using Panopto, we've, it's, a, it's a video content management space. Um, yes, we are having a Panopto workshop. <laughs> but in the meantime, if you come on the help session, <clears throat> we'll be more than happy to walk you through it. Dr. Sia? Yes. I just have a concern. It might not be a big issue, but uh, I'm thinking that if we record our Zoom class session on the real class time that we're going to do, and then post it online e-learn, then why would the student actually attend the class in, during the class time? They can see the video anytime. So then I will lecture in an empty classroom almost. Well, here's my thing, Doc. It's really a personal preference about that. Some people it really is. You're not, it is not a requirement that you record your, your lectures. It is not. It is really a personal oh, Okay, preference. so it's kind of optional. Okay. It depends it on is, different types very, of course. It is, it is okay. very optional. And if you okay, feel great, like great. Okay. that may, um, but see what you may want to do is not post it right away. Um, right, right. Maybe before the exam or something, you know. Uh, so maybe that might help them. Okay, yeah. I, I got it. Yes. I got it. Yes. Any other questions? Or I just comments? want to also mention there's an attendance checker on Zoom as well for those of you all who will be holding class on Zoom. So you can always check, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and see who who is participating, who's attending. Uh, and when they log in to, to view the course, you can set it up where it will um, let you know who all has viewed it. So you can, you know, you, you'll have some accountability if you do it that way. It's certainly a personal preference, but I, I understand exactly what you're saying about students, you know, choosing not to come to class live. And I would even set that up in my participation points or engagement points, you know, um, if they're not showing up to the live class, <clears throat> make sure that they know there'll be a loss of, of points along the way. Yeah. <clears throat> And I just realized someone sent me a, a message that I neglected to share <laughs> where I'm at at Tennessee State. That's important. Uh, <laughs> so again, I'm, I'm Dr. Carolyn Davis. I am uh, the Assistant Vice President in Student Affairs, uh, but I've, I've, I've been in Student Affairs and Academia pretty much my uh, entire professional career. But if you need me, <laughs> I can be found in the, in the Division of Student Affairs right now. Okay, oh, Chad. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of attendance, and not, you know, the students are very savvy, they're very tech savvy. And so they can um, be attending, uh, but they won't turn the cameras on. I don't require them to turn the cameras on. Uh, but they might ne not necessarily be present. I mean, the phone could be in their car somewhere and they're doing something else. And so usually I try to use a Socratic method and Say, hey, Jones, what about this? Yeah. Uh, then you'll usually hear a little bit of a silence, probably as their classmates are texting them, yo, man, Dr. P is asking the question. <laughs> so right. just keep them on their toes because they will <clears throat> turn their cameras off and they'll be attending, <laughs> but they won't really be attending. But then you also should, you should, Dr. Padgett, that's very true, but there are other things that you can insert. I mean, you can do the polls just use you know insert some interactive something that requires them to engage um and periodically and they'll get the message that you know if you know i can't just log on and just be here and not and not be expected to pay it. And, and and yes i also have polls uh mm -hmm. while i'm presenting where um, students have to um, engage in the polls or I'll ask a chat question and have everyone to put an answer. That way they have to stay on even if the camera is not on. Yeah. That's a great idea, Dr. Melton. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. 
That's so true. Well, listen, guys, I'm going to stop this recording right now. I probably should have stopped it a long time ago.